Hello class, um, this is chapter 23 and it's about evolution. Um, it starts from very basics, uh, fundamentals, and it goes all the way to human evolution. Uh, there are portions of this chapter I'm not too crazy about. Uh, so, and I'll go over that, I'll tell you which part you don't have to emphasize on. Uh, but um, it would be good for you guys to read it. Then whatever, you don't have to worry about it. Um, I say, read it on your own. Um, I'll let you just like previous chapters and it's not gonna be much emphasis on those. Whatever I emphasize on, whatever I go over, you need to pay more attention to it uh, for the quiz questions or the exam questions. Okay, so these are the learning outcomes and uh, origin of life. Uh, biomolecules, the organic molecules of life, uh, so that's what's called biomolecules. And life, they say, originated uh, 3.5 to uh, 4 billion years ago, BYA, uh, billion years ago. And then we have MYA, million years ago. So anyhow, uh, which you will see it later on during the chapter from non-living. Again, I'm not going to ask you how many billion years ago this was the life, because these numbers constantly change just recently. Uh, an article came up that it says it was 7 billion instead of uh, 5 or 3.5, 4 billion. It was 7 billion years ago. So don't worry about that numbers. I'm not crazy, but it was a long time ago. For our purposes, it was a long time ago. Small organic molecules, they're called simple organic molecules called monomers, like glucose is a monomer. Uh, one amino acid is a monomer, which we already talked about it at the beginning of semester, evolved from inorganic molecules. Inorganic molecules are like uh, salt. Salt is an inorganic molecule. Water is inorganic molecule. Uh, carbon dioxide is inorganic molecules. So magnesium, iron, these are the things that they said uh, they are inorganic molecules and glucose, lipid, um, Protein, these are organic molecules, okay? So that is amino acids, nucleotides, and uh, uh, amino acids, nucleotides, monomers. He's talking about amino acids, nucleotides. He's talking about monomers. Do not confuse it, this PowerPoint. These are monomers. These are not inorganic. Inorganic molecule like carbon dioxide, water, salt. Anyhow, I don't want to... Confuse you. Then macromolecules, when you add glucose molecules together, then uh, let's say if you add these glucose molecules together, so you have 10, if you would, glucose molecules or 10 amino acids, then that's a macromolecule, okay, which we studied it, uh, at the beginning. So joined by uh, make a polymer, macromolecules, DNA, a protein, and RNA, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, protocells, it means the cells, be, the molecules, the things before the cells, the structures before the cells, uh, protobionts, uh, they call them first cell precursors, polymers became enclosed in membrane, and then uh, living cells, uh, protobionts, acquired the ability to self-replicate. Stages one through three C, you will see the PowerPoint, you know what I mean by one through three C, uh, one through three <laughs> involve the process of chemical evolution and occurred before the origin of life. Stage four is when life, first life evolved on uh, process of biological evolution. Right here, that's what it's talking about. So you have inorganic, as I said, uh, on the bottom of molecules, inorganic uh, evolved to um, small organic molecules to monomers, okay? And then monomers evolved to polymers right here. And then polymers, first you had a membrane, that's a phospholipid by layer membrane. And that enclosed, the membrane enclosed, and then inside of it you had the RNA, RNA, which is the cell. Okay, chemical and biological evolution. Small organic molecules, Earth, uh, early atmosphere was formed by gases. They were toxic gases to us right now. If those gases at the beginning of the earth were on the surface of the earth, we would not be alive. We would be dead, okay? Escaping from all kind of volcanoes uh, like methane gas, uh, nitrogen gas, uh, these are at the, at the surface of the earth. Uh, 
uh, free oxygens had little, if any, free oxygens were extremely hot. Earth was extremely hot, and water was only uh, a gas um, and formed dense clouds. And as the Earth cooled, water vapor to condense to liquid form rain, and then rain washed gases that they were in the atmospheres and other chemicals in the oceans and rainfalls created the oceans. Small organic molecules, Earth, early atmospheres continued. Primitive uh, Earth had many sources of energy, volcanoes, uh, meteorites, radioactive isotopes, lightning, and ultraviolet radiation. Ozone was not one. Ozone was not one. So it was not a force of energy at the beginning of the uh, Mother Earth. Gases use this uh, energy to react with one another and uh, form a small organic molecule. So in 1953, um, that is most accepted theory right now. I will talk about a few different theories, but that is the most accepted theory. Stanley Miller was a graduate student he did not have a PhD, he was working on his master's degree. And what happened, he put the primitive gases in a chamber in a flask, and he passed electricity, a shock to it, and he had a vacuum chamber, just like the earth. Uh, there was no oxygen, there was no air uh, on the surface of the earth. And when he passed the electricity through it, because of the clouds, the clouds have negative clouds and positive clouds were able to uh, create a, um, a spark if you would, electricity. And then after that, uh, he uh, was able to form some uh, chemical molecules, which there, there were boiling water, you know, the surface of the earth was hot, he had a chamber, and then what happened, he formed some organic molecules. I'm looking for the organic molecules. Yeah, these are the gases that are, they were on the surface of the earth. And here are uh, the organic molecule, uh, right here, small, small organic molecules were formed right here, uh, right here, there were organic molecules. So that is what Stanley Miller explained and uh, make sure you know that. Other hypotheses, well, they say other uh, uh, hypotheses of small organic monomers, they may evolve on thermal vents at the bottom of the oceans provided all element, uh, elements and conditions necessary to synthesize organic molecules, some comets, meteorites, they came uh, with organic molecules, most accepted one among the comets were from Mars. Okay, so there are some fossils of records have been found on Mars uh, of the bacteria, so uh, there possibly that's another uh, theory, and then after that they so the organic molecules, we are talking about the very basic organic molecules, where did they come from at the beginning? Okay, so that's pretty much what we are talking about. Then macromolecules, two hypotheses that explains how small organic molecules joined into larger molecules. RNA first hypothesis. So RNA was needed to form the first cell and uh, could have carried out a process of life usually associated with DNA. And then the other one, the uh, second theory is protein first hypothesis. So first protein was a, so amino acids got together, made the protein molecules, and then, um, then the rest um, occurred. Protocells, early cells that carried metabolism but not, could not reproduce, that's what they say. So metabolism came, uh, you learn it at the beginning of the semester. So what am I talking about? Uh, cellular respiration. Uh, glycolysis, uh, that they're saying that happened first. And then uh, you had the, the cells were able to uh, multiply. And it could have formed if lipids mixed uh, with uh, uh, microspheres and uh, was probably heterotrophs. So heterotrophs, it means they can eat anything. They were not autotrophs, autotrophs, they were cells that they were doing photosynthesis. Uh, so I had to be given a fermenter. They had to make fermentation. Uh, that's the most basic process of uh, cellular respiration. The first true cells, the uh, RNA uh, hypothesis about how the first cell acquired DNA and enzymes, 
reproduce and so on and so forth of these enzymes could use RNA as a template. And then uh, we already talked about this. Some of the proteins, uh, protocells were able to synthesize DNA from nucleotides in the ocean. So the first cell uh, would have contained RNA genes that could have replicated. Okay, so uh, these are the, uh, the progress and biological evolution. Um, make sure you know those. So biological evolution, let's say the first cell so far, let's say the very first cell was formed and they were prokaryote. And you know what prokaryote means? It means they do not have nucleus, okay? Which lack a nucleus. Uh, from uh, these evolved eukaryotic cells. So we believe, uh, scientists believe that from uh, prokaryotic cells evolved eukaryotic cells. So at, the, at first they were single cell without nucleus, and then now you have cells that have nucleus, the eukaryote. The first eukaryote cells were single cells, protista, like a protist, and then the protist gave rise uh, to multicellularities and other. Uh, kingdom, fungi, plants, and animals. And Robert Whittaker was the very first person back in uh, late 1960s. He proposed that uh, the prokaryotic cells right here evolved to uh, eukaryotic cells, the protista. These are all protista. And then protista evolved to animals, protista evolved to plants, and protista evolved to fungi. Okay. So we do not have fungi evolved to plants, or we do not have fungi evolved to animals. No, it's, it's the protista-like organisms. All of these organisms evolved to fungi, evolved to plants, evolved to animals. And before that, before protista, it was prokaryote, the bacteria, which do not have nucleus. All life has gone on in biological evolution. Two important aspects of biological evolution descended from common ancestors and adaptations. So all of the organisms had a common ancestor. And then all of the organisms adapted to the environment, adaptation to the environment. Descended from an original cell explains why all the cells have a common chemistry because all of the cells, if you look at them, they have DNA. Bacteria have DNA, fungi have DNA, human have DNA. They all do cellular respiration. Uh, they might not do the, uh, with the mitochondria, the cells that do not have mitochondria, they do not do uh, the electron transport chain and so on and so forth. But they all do the fermentation, glycolysis, which you learned in previous chapters. So adaptations allows, uh, allows organisms and organisms to survive and reproduce uh, in its environment. Mechanisms, uh, uh, mechanism of biological evolution, Charles Darwin, he came and he proposed natural selection. He went around the earth in five years uh, through the eagle, uh, and that has story of its own. But anyhow, most significant of his uh, mechanism, he, his contribution was natural selection. And before that, it was uh, Lamarck who said organisms evolved individually. Darwin said, no, organisms evolve in a population. And I'll show you a picture and we'll talk about it a little bit. That was the main difference between what Lamarck said and Darwin said, okay? So when, organ when the population evolves, not the individual organisms, then what happens, that's the uh, natural selection, okay? So let's look at this example. Here is what Lamarck said. Lamarck said, well, the giraffe see that the food is on top of the tree. So over a period of time, the neck gets longer, longer, longer. Finally, uh, generation after generation, since they are reaching out uh, to the top of the tree and uh, they can pick up the food, okay? That's individual. That's what Lamarck said. Lamarck said individual organisms evolve. Darwin said, no. That's not true. We had a population, some of them had long neck, some of them had short neck. The ones with short neck, since they could not reach the top of the tree, they died. Of course, they strived, they could evolve, the neck got elongated a period of time, but the ones that could not survive, they, um, they died. And that's the natural selection. Excuse me, I have to, oh, 
pause this for a let me do this. Sorry about that. I guess I don't have to pause it. The birds are knocking on my door. Not that. So anyhow, uh, Darwin came up with a book of um, uh, natural selection, uh, the origin of species. Sorry about that. Origin of species. That was the name of Darwin's book. Make sure you know that. In 1859, he published it. And then um, up to date, there's still uh, people reading it. And um, uh, so anyhow, so he talked about variations, the, which is in a population, you have variations, the ones that cannot survive, they die, okay? And the ones that can survive, they will survive and carry on those genes, those inheritance to next generation, okay? Competition for limited sources, uh, that's pretty much uh, adaptations, the environment, uh, shape the uh, organisms. Artificial selection, that's what we human from early on, we recognize that. We see the animals that give a lot of uh, wool or give a lot of milk, we breed them together. Okay, So that's called artificial selection. Evidences of evolution, the most prominent evidence of evolution are our fossil records. Okay, fossils. There are bones, there are fossil records, and then they use the radioactive isotopes to estimate the age of these uh, fossils. It goes back many, many million years ago. And those organisms are not on planet Earth anymore. Okay, so that's what the fossils are the best source of evidence for evolution. Um, the remains of the species at least 10,000 years ago, billions of years ago, and so on and so forth, footprints. And, um, and then there are, uh, of course, organisms that they meant, uh, they le are left in sedimentary rocks. So there are a few evidences of evolution. Uh, the, the organisms in the past that left their footprints, uh, either in the ambers of the uh, bark of the trees or uh, in the sedimentations when the mudslides came and buried organisms and uh, another uh, event occurred and there were layers, strata, right here, I guess right here, uh, strata, uh, strata, stratum, uh, singular strata, layers. If you took geology, you know what I'm talking about, layers of layers, they were on top of each other. And then when we human excavate them, and then we saw these organisms uh, from past, and then they help us to shape what happened in the past. As you know, these, these terminologies, paleontologists are people who scientists study fossil records and paleontology, science of discovery of fossils. Uh, so, uh, you know. uh, prokaryotes are first signs of life uh, in the fossil records. These were uh, followed by single cell eukaryotes and fishes evolved before terrestrial animals. That's true, fishes were here before plants and animals. And on land, non flowering plants, make sure you know these things, were here before flowering plants. Non flowering plants, I'm talking about uh, trees like evergreens, that they do not have flowers, they have cones. They were here uh, before. And amphibians were here before reptiles. Um, including the dinosaurs, they were here, well, here there's uh, a transition. Um, let me pause this. This meeting is being recorded. All right, sorry about that. I had to go and get rid of the birds. But transitional fossils have characters of two different groups. Uh, they tell us who is uh, related to whom and how evolution occurred. Uh, for example, that is Archaeopteryx, it's an, uh, which is a, a, a bird that is found in the stone. It's called Archaeopteryx photographica. It was found in Germany first time. And then uh, that fossil records is uh, saying the, the birds were, uh, they had features of reptiles and the birds, uh, the current birds. So here is a picture of the Archaeopteryx uh, graphica. Uh, right here, so it was the reptile and bird combined together. 
uh, transitional fossils, uh, fossils show that the whales had terrestrial ancestors. So these huge dolphins and whales we are looking at right now, um, the theory has it they were on the land first and for some reason or another, they went to the water because the earth, some kind of uh, predator or some kind of disaster, that's what Darwin talked about, natural selection, uh, because there is a disaster coming after these organisms and these organisms can adapt themselves. So that's pretty much what natural selection means. Here they are, they're showing that these organisms were Biogeography, you know, at the beginning, the earth all, was all one piece and because of titanic uh, plates and everything that moved, they shifted a piece here and a piece here and a piece here. So what happened? All of the organisms were, who were here, they ended up, I should draw some circles too. They ended up in different islands, okay? And since they were in different islands, they evolved to different species, okay? And that's what happens, for example, um, the marsupials, the kangaroos, wallabies, they cannot be found uh, anywhere else. They're mainly focused in uh, Australia, okay? So when organisms went to other islands, they evolved and they adapted to the new environment, okay? And that's another thing Darwin found. Darwin went to Galapagos Islands and he saw these organisms that are found nowhere else in the world. Okay, those giant turtles, he saw them. So anyhow, and um, here they are, of course, you know, Tasmanian wolf is extinct now. And uh, we human, we had them around, but uh, you know, they are not around anymore. Uh, anatomical evidences, so uh, it's based on homology, the similarities, for example, the similarity between homo, I didn't spell it correctly, sorry about that. Homology, homology yes, the similarities between my hands and the, uh, the foot uh, of horses or my hand and the wings of a bat. That's a homology, okay? So uh, homologous structures, analogy is the similarities between the structures, that's homologous structures. Analogous structures is the function, the similarity, the, the wings of a bat are the wings of a bird are different than wings of a uh, fly. So it means they had two different ancestors. And that's analogy. They both do the same thing. They both fly. The wings of a bird and wings of a uh, uh, insect fly, or, or mosquito, dragonfly. So that's analogy, analogous. Here they are is homology. Look at the structure of the legs of bat, whales, uh, cat, horse, human. They're pretty much the same, very similar to each other. Vestigial structure, I think I talked about it in here before. Um, vestigial structure, it means they had a function. They do not have a function now. The structures like mammary gland in human, in men, we, we had a function for that one time. Females mammary gland still have a function, but male mammary gland does not have a function. So it is vestigial. So, and then um, like um, the, uh, the flies, they have, uh, you know, the mosquito, not the mosquitoes, the, the house flies that I'm talking about, they have wings, they can fly, but underneath of that, there are two other wings. Those wings are vestigial. We don't know what they are there for. They, you, when they evolve at the beginning, they have four sets of wings, now they only, now they only, they still have four, but they only need two of them. There are many examples of that in biology, that wood is vestigial, and you can uh, read your uh, PowerPoints and get familiar with that. Okay, more anatomical evidences. So as I talked about it, if you look at an embryo of a human, instead of this, this imagine this is human. 
instead of it, very similar. With a check, we both have both post anal tail right here is a tail after anus. The anus of the chick is right around here. The anus of the um, of the pig or human is right around here. But there is a tail right there. Okay, and pharyngeal pouches. So they have like a gills. Okay, so they call it pharyngeal pouches, which they are in fluid. Both the chick embryo and human embryo, they are in fluid. They have to do respiration. They have to get the oxygen from somewhere. Okay, of course they get from blood vessels. They have gills. These are evidences that the life was originated from C. So anyway. Biochemical evidence of evolution. So all of living organisms use ATP, all of living as source of energy, all of living organisms, they divide based on DNA, even back then, even nowadays, at the beginning it could be RNA, but now at the beginning, at this moment of time, it's all DNA, okay? So there are 20 amino acids uh, common in most living organisms. Humans may share many much simpler organisms. This is a cytochrome. Uh, cytochrome C, I didn't talk about it before, but it's a protein molecule which is involved in cellular respiration in mitochondria. And what happens, uh, they are comparing that, for example, yeast is 51 difference amino acid, and then a moth, the flying moth is uh, 30, and fish is 20, and turtle is 18 is uh, 11 and pigs is nine and monkeys there too and human is cytochrome C right here. Um, as I said, important in electron transport chain in mitochondria. We talked about, I didn't talk about it in great detail with cytochrome C. But that's the differences of the amino acids. It's a protein are made up of amino acids. So uh, classification of human um, organisms are classified by their evolutionary relatedness. Yes, nowadays it's changing a lot. It's going based on DNA, which is fine. That's okay. Uh, but still, they have to use homology, okay, in order to classify organisms. What I mean by classify organisms, uh, phylum, class, order, genus, species, king, or came over for a good sex. So um, that's what it is. Before that is domain, okay? So within the domain, there are um, uh, kingdom, after king, Paul, phylum, uh, uh, came, uh, class, over, order, uh, came over for um, family, and genus and species, okay? So, uh, binomial names, it means uh, uh, Carlos Linnaeus proposed that there are supposed to be two names uh, for every organisms that there are on planet Earth, and it was accepted then. He proposed it in 1600, 1700, or oh, uh, can't, yeah. Anyhow, but that's what binomial name, names means. It means genus and species. For human is Homo, that's the name of genus, and sapiens is the name of uh, is the name of the species, but anyhow. So here is the uh, evolution of human, the domain eukaryote. It was around two uh, billion years ago, and then the kingdom animalia came six hundred million years ago, and then phylum chordata five hundred and forty million years ago. This is a classification of human. So we are in domain Eukarya, we are in kingdom Animalia, we are phylum Chordata, class Mammalia, that's what I was talking about. Order Primate and family Homundiae and genus Homo and sapiens is the name of our species, Homo sapiens. So Carlos Linneo said uh, we should refer to organ, we should classify them just like this kingdom uh, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And at the end, when you want to refer to an organism, you should refer it to as a homo sapiens. Because the people in Japan call human a different name. People in Saudi Arabia call human a different name. 
here in the English language, they call human a different name. But all over the world, he said, let's call it Homo sapiens. That's what scientific name means. Uh, data codes for RNA changes slowly during evolution. RNA sequences data indicates that there are three domains in life, archaea, eukarya, and bacteria, which are right here. Here are archaea. It means the very early bacteria uh, evolved. That's what archaea means. And then you have a prokaryote. They're more recent um, right now. Uh, bacteria. And then, of course, eukarya, all of these guys, the nucleus, the cell has a nucleus. Okay. These guys, the cell does not have a nucleus. It has DNA. It has DNA, but it does not have a nucleus. These guys, eukarya, have a nucleus. And all of these together are called prokarya. Okay, DNA and uh, human evolution, DNA sequence indicates that last uh, common ancestors for the apes and humans have 7 million years ago. So, and then for more recent events, uh, mitochondrial DNA, as you know, mitochondria has its own DNA, same as chloroplast in plants have their own DNA, it's called mtDNA. Okay, used because empty uh, DNA changes over more than uh, more frequently than nuclear DNA, and empty DNA indicates that human first evolved in Africa and later migrated to Eurasia. Uh, so very important that you should know uh, that the very first human were uh, from were uh, in Africa. Here are the Asian and African apes. So uh, some of the things. And again, now we are getting to the part that I'm not too crazy about um, that um, you, I, I like to pass over and I'm not gonna talk about it much. We'll talk about it. There are some quiz questions, exam questions about it uh, and whatever it is, uh, I, will, uh, I will emphasize on it. Uh, primate limbs are mobile and hands and feet and have five digits. In many primates, the big toes and some are both for uh, approachable. It means can touch and uh, other toes and uh, fingers. So uh, approachable, uh, that's what uh, that term means. Okay, so you should know that. Results in gripping and uh, both uh, powerful and precise can easily uh, reach out and bring food into the mouth. Okay, in uh, binocular vision, so uh, you have two eyes and uh, they can give us a stereo uh, scope, vision, uh, depth and perceptions. Human and apes have uh, three different kinds of cones. As you know, uh, the cones are red for the art vision. You know, we talked about it's red, green, and uh, blue. Okay, that's what he's talking about. And other colors you see is the combination of those ones. Uh, reproductive, uh, so it's when they were moving from branches to branches, from trees to trees, it is hard to have many offsprings. So they have one offspring, you know, usually in most cases. And of course they have more than one, but one gestation, that's what I'm talking about. One gestation usually have one offspring. So uh, comparing human skeletons to chimpanzee skeletons, again, that is important. I guess I deleted uh, the stuff that uh, it was not that significant from your PowerPoints. But the, the most important thing um, that you should know, the ribs uh, on both of them, chimpanzees and human, they're attached to the, uh, they're attached to the muscles and um, of course, uh, the backbone of the human is almost like the S shape, okay? But the backbone of chimpanzees are straight and the legs are uh, a little bit bowed, 
and the legs of human are more straight. Okay, so please read these things and then <clears throat> uh, know that uh, what I'm talking about, the, the ribs, they, there is a bone right here, you know that it's called sternum. So the ribs are attached to this. Okay. Also, they have sternum and the ribs are attached to the sternum. Okay, so we are done with that evolution of homonyms, uh, which are us and evolutionary tree and lineage. Um, then it comes up with talking about different species and uh, names, and this is the hypothetical uh, movement of organisms toward the top of the ladder. And um, So these are very interesting information. Um, I wish you would read them. I'm getting, we're getting to the end. Uh, or bipedal postures, you know, I talked about that a little bit before in the PowerPoints. And these are earliest fossil of uh, monins. And then um, uh, the very first organisms, uh, human-like organisms were out of Africa and then um, there are some similar species here in Australia as well. That's what we call them, uh, Australia pithecinus. And um, Lucy, importance of Lucy, uh, it would be important that you know why Lucy was important because uh, that is the you know, skeleton found in Africa and then it indicated it, uh, the life, uh, the human, I'm talking about human life. Uh, was uh, spread from Africa to Eurasia. Okay, mosaic evolution, it is different body parts change at different rates and different times, okay? So that says, for example, the Neanderthal man and the modern human did not um, interbreed and so on and so forth. The, uh, so let's see what else. Fossil records assigned to genus Homo, um, here they are, Homo habilis, um, and then talks about the Homo habilis and uh, the cultures and everything else, Homo erectus, of course, uh, they are uh, extinct for now. And then this shows the timeline and then where life was and then where evolved at a different timeline. So this was the migration. So Indonesia where the last uh, place we uh, human uh, migrated to, uh, went to China and then um, in, uh, two charts of China went to Eurasia, but right after Africa, it was in Eurasia and then the rest of China and Far East. <clears throat> then talks about replacement model. I'm not too crazy about replacement model a little bit. Neanderthal, ne ne Neanderthal man, you know, different pronounced differently. But let's go with uh, Neanderthal man. And then um, that was, um, so uh, Cro-Magnons, uh, they are the people, the most modern people right now is called Cro-Magnons. And they were in the caves and they had the ability to use the tools better and they were, they would draw these, uh, whatever you see drawings in the caves were, uh, were, were possibly uh, from Cro-Magnets. And then uh, hunted cooperatively and so on and so forth. The movies you see uh, like Ice Ages probably were Cro-Magnets and uh, early Cro-Magnets. And uh, human variations. Very important, you should know this. This is getting toward the end of the chapter. I'm sure you're getting tired like me. So these are the things I would like you to know. Uh, the darker color for the UV, the, you know, and then the lighter color uh, the, because of vitamin D absorption. And then of course, the uh, in Africa, they're taller and slender and human regulates temperature, um, volume Y and Eskimos are shorter and uh, bulkier, so and so on and so forth. All right. So that's the end of this chapter. If you have any question, please let me know. Uh, we will discuss.